Mr. Marks, Howard Marks, he is with Oak Tree and long ago securities analysis at Citigroup as he came out of uh, Wharton. He has been out front and center on the debate over prosperity and capitalism uh, in America. Howard Marks, great support of the show. Lisa, he's, he, he, he and I go back far enough where, you know, he was just a huge support when I was trying to figure out what to do with equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. He's a tour de force, and he was one of the founders of the distressed debt market in many ways. Yeah. And he uh, has said he started in stocks, didn't understand them, and then he understood bonds because it is a cash flow question of are you going to get your money back and are you offsetting the risk of what you're seeing with respect to the potential for some sort of default or lost pay. And with then has been philanthropy as well. Joining us now, David Rubenstein, co-founder, co-chairman, Carlisle Group, of course, host of Bloomberg uh, Wealth for Spirited conversation. Did you get an equity call, David Rubenstein, from Mr. Marks? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say so, but I would say that what you described about him is certainly true. Howard Marks started in 1995 Oak Tree with his partner Bruce Karsh, and in the ensuing years, they built into one of the largest debt operations or investment firms in the world, an incredible track record. Howard Marks is best known for the memos he writes to his clients, which are seen all over the world because they go more to than just his clients. And he's very uh, intelligent in what he says about the markets and what they're likely to do. And I suspect right. uh, the Federal Reserve probably reads them as well. On a type two construct, Howard Marks is not so much what he does, but what he does not do. What is the number one thing that Mr. Marks, in his philosophy, tries to avoid? Well, he tries to avoid undue risk. Um, he tries to make certain he understands exactly what he's investing in, and he loves uh, to invest in fixed income instruments. And the main point of the interview was that he sees a gigantic shift from equities to fixed income instruments over the next couple of years, because as interest rates are likely to stay high, in his view, uh, it's likely that more and more investors will say, I don't want to take the risk of equities where you could lose all of your money, and I'd rather go into fixed income instruments where you're going to get a current yield and almost certainly likely to get your money back. And this is what we've heard from Apollo as well, the sort of golden era for credit, particularly private credit at a time of that kind of yield. Before we get there, though, David, how much is there going to be some sort of washout of companies that finance themselves during a low rate uh, era that don't really fit with a much higher borrowing cost? Well, for sure, there will be some uh, companies that don't work out. I think particularly things in real estate, which borrowed a fair amount of money, commercial real estate, office buildings are probably going to have some real debt restructuring problems. But overall, I would say the, the principal issue that he wanted to address is the, the I, I would say, the, the macro shift in investor sentiment away from equities and private equity and more towards fixed income and private credit. Now, of course, um, he's in that business, but I do think he has a lot of uh, truth to what he says. And a lot of people would agree with him. I'm wondering from your perspective, David, you've been in this business a very long time as well, and I'm wondering whether you think that in some ways, because of the amount of money going into private credit to other private assets, they're going to offset some of the uh, lending constriction that we're going to see from banks. In other words, are they going to take over that role more and more as banks are forced to pull back with the balance sheet that they have uh, full of treasuries? Well, the, the banks are generally regulated and pretty tightly in many ways. The private credit market, where you have many private firms that are not regulated for this particular aspect of what they do, uh, they have some uh, greater freedom to do things that the banks may not be able to do. And there is, therefore, some tension between the banks and what they can do and the private credit firms and what they can do. And I suspect, ultimately, uh, Congress will take some look at whether there's a problem there. I don't think there is a problem, but I do think that if there are defaults and so forth in, in the future, people may take a look at private credit. But right now, the private credit market is operating pretty efficiently, and I don't see any need for regulation at this point. David, how much, though, has the uh, expansion of private credit offset some of the contraction in lending that we've seen at banks? And, and frankly, especially uh, with companies that are struggling with interest rates, offering them extensions, offering them financing deals to offset some of the impact of higher rates. Well, it's offset it to some extent, but you remember, you, the private credit people are still have uh, to charge fairly high interest rates compared to what we saw f three or four years ago. So it's not as if it's, it's a free lunch. So private credit firms are able to do things that banks can't do, but they can't give away the money for free. So uh, there are constraints, and there are fewer deals getting done, and fewer larger deals getting done generally, particularly when you have to borrow enormous sums of money.